From the KSL Broadcast House, this is Sunday Edition with Doug Wright. And a good morning to you. Welcome to Sunday Edition. Today we have a conversation with Senator Mitt Romney about the ongoing debate over raising the debt ceiling and what the consequences might be in the short term and, of course, in the long term. But first, we're talking to Representative Tyler Clancy. Representative, welcome, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Doug. You are youngest lawmaker in the state of Utah. We, we've got to talk about that and also involved in, uh, in policing our state as well. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a police officer in the city of Provo and I represent District 60, which covers BYU and the surrounding neighborhoods. So while you're the youngest legislator, that's also the youngest district. <laughs> it is, but we, we have a lot of uh, young families and college students alike uh, make our, our city awesome. Let's talk about the piece of legislation that you sponsored this year. And also, Representative Kwan, too, was very much involved with this. And perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about how the partnership came about and what her passion has been over the last several years, because this isn't her first time at this rodeo. You're exactly right, Doug. And Senator Karen Kwan, who represents West Valley City, uh, it was Senate Bill 101. And this is a piece of legislation she's been working on for many years, especially since the pandemic with the rise of anti-Asian violence. So the, the bill was an education bill for the police academy that we have here in Utah. Um, it's about victim targeting offenders. So offenders who are choosing their victim, whether it's based on race, religion or, or political background um, and we're adding uh, extra education in the police academy to make sure our officers are trained to deal with those specific risk factors. We might mention that we did invite Representative Karen Kwan to be on the show today and unfortunately she wasn't able to join us. Uh, she even was kind enough to send us uh, a little video which unfortunately did not uh, did not happen. Uh, it, it, it got a little fuzzed up in, in the process so I appreciate you kind of letting us know her role in this because it has been so important. When somebody, you know, th there are various degrees of crime and intent is such an important part of it. Was it premeditated? Was there intent? Or was it something that just happened, a crime of passion, whatever it might be, or even desperation? When it is premeditated, when it is contemplated, when it is targeted, it really makes sense to me that first of all, there'd be a higher penalty, but also training in that area as well. Well, and listen, and I represent a community that has a very strong uh, religious base. And, and, and what we've recognized, what we're doing by, with Senator Kwan's legislation, is we're recognizing that when we have an offender who targets a victim based on uh, one of these, uh, you know, factors, it's an attack on that entire community, not just that individual. And we need to treat it uh, to that higher degree. Sometimes, too, with, with crimes like that, it, it almost becomes a little terroristic because if, if they realize that it's targeting a certain group, other people of that group feel endangered as, as well. So all of this makes so much sense. How is it being received by uh, fellow uh, law enforcement uh, personnel? <laughs> you know, when I got back to the department after uh, my service session, they said, oh, great, you gave us more uh, <laughs> yeah. training to do. But right. uh, in all seriousness, uh, we as police officers, you know, a lot of people think that you're just chasing bad guys in the middle of the night. That is a part of the profession, but it's, it's, it's really a more diverse than that. You're here for the mental health crisis. You're here on a family's worst day of their lives. You are in the homes and you see abject poverty. And so I think police officers appreciate that extra training. So when they're thrust into a situation that has those big consequences like we're talking about, they feel confident that they have the training they need to get the job done. It is amazing how training works because I think most people do hate training. <laughs> and you know, sometimes we'll get an assignment here at KSL and you go, yeah, okay, whatever. But it's amazing every now and then there's that situation where it really counts and it really clicks in. What, what, will, what do you envision Again, as somebody who not only passed the legislation with Representative Kwan, but also you're there on the, on the front lines, as we've already talked about with law enforcement, what do you envision as some of the, the things that will be taught? It's, it's all about recognizing the, the broader consequences of the situation. We've seen not just per se in Utah, but across the country, we've been seeing a rise in this targeted type of violence, whether it's to religious groups of a certain faith, whether it's towards a racial group, and that's been you know Senator Kwan representing the Asian and Pacific Islander community, that's been her focus as well. But it's being able to send a young officer, you know they could be as young as 21, to start to 
pick up those clues that might lead us to find the bigger situation. And, and ultimately, you know, that will be taken on by the investigative division, but that patrol officer needs to know those, um, those certain signs to be able to, to follow that trail of breadcrumbs, if you will. Do we have a particular group you already mentioned with, uh, with Representative Kwan, what has been her motivation and, and her background, but is there a particular group of individuals that has been unfortunately targeted in the state of Utah? You know, it's, uh, we're, we're a melting pot here in the state of Utah. We're way more diverse than we give ourselves credit for. Right. I was talking to Rabbi of Remy Zippel the other day, yeah. who's a great leader in the Jewish community, and he even he has seen uh, you know, a rise in anti-Semitism across the United States and in, and in Utah as well. And so I think it's really not you know, pointing fingers, but it's on all of us as leaders of our state to tamp out hate wherever we see it, whether that's through education and resources or that enforcement aspect, which Senator Kwan's legislation uh, is addressing. Over many years now, I've had the chance to talk to <clears throat> elected officials and people in authority who do come from a minority background, and everybody's got a story. Yeah. I mean, Vince Gill, you know, I've done, uh, uh, Sim Gill. Sim Gill, pardon me, Vince Gill's a whole different deal. <laughs> but yeah, Sim Gill, you know, he, he was telling me, the Sikh community, yeah, and it, it just, shocked me, surprised me. And, and listen, we, uh, you know, we, as a legislator, when you're sitting there at your desk, you have to recognize that there's certain people who can't be there. You know, kind of the, the voiceless, if you will. And I think it's on us to, to think about the chairs that are empty, you know, at our, at our committees or at our legislative sessions and make sure that we're giving a voice to the voiceless as well. Whatever that marginalized group is or the people who can't make it, even if it's someone who's on the economic margins and they might not be able to be there for an 8.30 a.m. committee meeting, right. the onus is on us to step up and make sure that they're taken care of as well. I'm always interested when we're going for a goal and we're doing substantial things. Legislation is no small deal and it's targeted at something. How do we tell if we're winning or not? How do we tell if it's working or not? That's a great question, and there's so many different issues that we could ask that question. How are we making progress? You know, can, can you tell the whole story in a graph? Can you tell the whole story in a grade? I really think the, the main uh, education that we'll see there is when we talk to those groups. When we talk to our, uh, you know, our marginalized groups or our minority communities, or our religious friends, and say, tell me, uh, you know, have you seen a change since here to here? Right. Have you been seeing the changes or the... Uh, whether it's on social media, whether it's in your faith community, have you been feeling it? And making sure that the people who have the lived experience, when we can bring those voices to the table, I feel like that is really a good uh, starting point. And obviously bringing the data and the audits together as well. After passing this legislation, and I know <laughs> anybody who thinks you guys only are there for 45 you know, working days a year are just out to lunch. I, I've seen it up close and personal. You guys are working all the time and taking care of your constituents. What's, and I've just got a second here, but what's on your radar for next year? Well, listen, uh, you know, for me, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Speaker Brad Wilson, uh, Majority Leader Mike Schultz, they're leading out on stewardship, affordability, and historic investments. For me, my main concern is I think families are feeling that economic squeeze like never before, whether it's with inflation or the price of groceries. So yeah. for me, it's about sticking up for those people who are living paycheck to paycheck and uh, helping them uh, to gain a better future. Representative, thank you. We need to acknowledge your wife is with <laughs> us as well, and we appreciate you both thank being you so here much. on Sunday glad to be here. edition. All right, we're going to take a break. Next, coming up, we're going to be talking with Senator Mitt Romney, so stay with us. Welcome back to the program. This week, I had the chance to talk with Senator Mitt Romney about the national debate over raising the debt ceiling. Senator Romney, as we approach uh, what is described as a budget crisis in the United States of America, I'm hearing uh, Yellen say that it could be in June. I'm hearing people on Wall Street saying day X, as they're referring to it, could be in August. We're hearing rumblings from the president about vetoes. We're hearing all kinds of things regarding, well, unless energy things are included, I won't sign it. Where do we stand right now? with the threat of defaulting on national debts here in the United States? Well, we've never done it before, obviously, and I think it's broader than just defaulting on the debt. That's something which is very frightening to people in the, the world of commerce and, frankly, our allies around the world when they hear that we might default on our debt. But it's broader than that. It means at that point, the United States of America could no longer send out any checks. 
That means social security checks could not be sent out after that date. It means checks to uh, our soldiers that are defending our country would not be sent out. We basically have no more money to send out because as a nation, as you know, we get two sources of revenue to pay for things. One is the tax revenue that comes in. And then number two is the money that we borrow. And uh, the truth is that we borrow a lot of money, about a trillion dollars a year, have been doing that for the last 10 years or more. And so to pay our bills, to pay the things we've agreed to pay, we have to both borrow and tax. And uh, we have to raise the debt ceiling in order to keep borrowing. And if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we will not pay Social Security, will not pay our soldiers. So it's a very uh, serious threat. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that we're not going to do that. We're obviously going to meet our obligations, but uh, it's a negotiation. It's a bit of a game of chicken to see, all right, uh, who's, who's going to blink uh, to make sure that we able to get, we're able to get all the things we want to get done. And frankly, the Republican position, which I agree, is that we've got to rein in the spending and move towards a balanced budget. And we want the president to agree to that before we agree to raising the debt ceiling. Well, how many times have you talked about this in campaigns and in interviews like this one? I know how often you and I have talked about this. <clears throat> there was a great quote in an article the other day attributed to you. And you said, by the way, if, if somebody's counting, it's approximately 80 deals like this have been made since the 1960s. But you said, of course, last time you had President Trump as the individual push pushing to raise the debt ceiling. But somehow, when we have a Democratic president, we, referring to Republicans, find religion. I've seen this go back and forth and back and forth and blame and blame and blame. And, you know, sometimes I'm just amazed at how apparently dense we are. It, it really is frustrating that, uh, frankly, anything the Democrats do, why we automatically oppose. Anything we do, they automatically oppose. Uh, and uh, I, I would ha be happy to engage in this kind of, uh, if you will, political warfare where the stakes not so high. But when it comes to paying our bills and paying Social Security and paying for our soldiers, we shouldn't be negotiating over that. In, in my view, the right way for us to proceed is if we don't agree with how much the government is spending, we should battle over the budget. And, uh, and if we have to close down government, we close down government. But don't stop sending checks to people who depend on them, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. That doesn't make sense. Uh, but, you know, we're now in this battle. Fortunately, the Republicans in the House have passed a measure. It raises the debt ceiling. It calls for a reduction in spending as well. And it's time for the president to say, all right, let's sit down and negotiate. Because when you have divided government, Republicans have one branch, the White House another, you have to have compromise. And the president says it's basically his way or the highway. And that's just not going to work. We're, we're going to have to have people sit down and negotiate together. Back to what you were talking about a moment ago, uh, paying our soldiers, Social Security, all kinds of things. These checks are already in the mail. I think a lot of Americans don't get that. We're already obligated for this debt. We are already sending the checks out. As the, the phrase is common, they're in the mail right now. It's just a matter of whether or not we allocate the money to be in the bank so they clear. You know, one of the big surprises uh, when I became involved with government was recognizing that uh, uh, the overwhelming amount of spending we do as the federal government, two thirds of spending isn't even voted on by the House, the Senate, signed by the president. It's automatic. It's our Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, our interest payments. These things happen whether we want them to or not. And they are the cause of the ma massive deficit that we have. The things we vote on, our military and other areas of, of spending, those things grow only as fast as the economy. They're not the problem. We just haven't been honest with the American people about the fact that we're an aging population. We have enormous expenses associated with retirees, and we're not willing to admit that and, uh, and, and make the accommodations necessary to make sure those programs are in balance. Stay with us. We'll be sharing the rest of the conversation that we had earlier this week with Mitt Romney right after this break. Thank you for staying with us. And now we continue our conversation with Senator Mitt Romney. Over the years, we've talked about many numbers. I can remember the shock at 15 trillion, 17 trillion, 21 trillion. Now we're talking about 31.4 trillion dollars in national debt. 
And I recall a conversation back when you were running for president about what would happen, and I think it was 17 trillion then, what would happen if all of a sudden the interest rates went back to normal? They were practically nil at the time we talked about that. But now that interest rates are climbing and they are getting back to, we, we think of them as high historically, they're really still quite low. But when the interest rates go from maybe 2% to 3 4 5 6%, what does that mean? How do we pay that kind of debt? Well, you've, uh, you've hit on the real key, in my opinion. Uh, which is that because the debt is now over $30 trillion, the interest payments this year that we're going to be making to people that hold treasury bonds, and these are foreign governments and sovereign wealth funds and so forth, the interest payments the federal government is going to make will total almost $750 billion. That happens to equal what we spend on our military every year. So uh, one question is how you remain the leader of the free world if you're basically you know, spending money uh, just to pay interest to other people. By the way, sending money to China, uh, which is the, the nation that we're concerned about militarily and economically, it, it makes no sense. And and I would note, we're never going to pay this off. The, uh, Doug, you and me, we're, we're getting older, all right? We're not going <laughs> to pay off this debt. It'll not be paid during our lifetime. So this means that the coming generations are going to get saddled with interest payments every year for the rest of their lives. They're going to be paying taxes to pay interest on the borrowings we did during our lifetime. It is immoral, in my view, for my generation, your generation, to continue to receive massive benefits and to say, hey, we're not gonna pay for it. We're gonna borrow, and we're gonna send the interest payments on to our kids for their entire lives. That is simply wrong. We should be sitting down and working together collaboratively to either raise the revenues that we use to pay for these programs or cut the, the long-term expenses. We gotta do something. Because the path that we're on, in my opinion, is unsustainable and has the potential of making America a weaker and weaker nation, unable to defend itself and our freedoms. When I see surveys and when I read articles about concerns millennials have about what we baby boomers have done with our stewardship, that's the number one thing I always hear. It's the national debt. Kevin McCarthy has been quoted as saying there will be no, quote, clean increase here. In other words, pretty much what you're talking about, others are talking about, let's wrangle this somewhere else, let's do it through the normal channels, let's talk about budgeting, let's do other things, but right now, let's pass something that will pay the bills. What about that? I've even heard the term, everybody's itching for a fight right now. What is likely to happen? Well, there is a lot of um, uh, counterproductive action around the political world. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, people want to show they're fighting. Uh, and uh, sometimes when the consequences are so great, they don't want to think about the consequences. They just want to go home and say, look, I fought for this and I fought for that. But this is the country we're talking about. And we have to do what we think is in the best interest of the nation. Uh, I, I, I wish we were not fighting over something as critical as sending out our checks and allowing people to rely on, uh, on, on the government to provide Social Security and, and defense. But uh, uh, at this stage, that's the battle which is going on. Uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that the president has been unwilling to engage on this. He says he won't negotiate on it. Uh, I think by virtue of the House having passed uh, a, a debt ceiling increase, making sure we can meet our, you know, our, pay our bills, at the same time putting in place a number of other measures that the president needs to sit down and say, OK, let's see if we can work out a compromise. And if we do, then this will all go away. But you know, let's let's not run up into the last minute. By the way, people wonder, why can't we set a specific date? How do we know whether it's in June or July that we run out of money? Well, the reason we can't set a specific date is the government doesn't know how much tax revenue is going to come in. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they, they look and see what the tax receipts are. Every quarter, uh, some people put in a payment, all right? So whether it's uh, withholding from your yeah, your payroll check or whether it's someone writing a check for their estimated taxes for the quarter, uh, they don't know exactly how much is coming in. They're pretty good at estimating how much is going out, but how much is coming in is uncertain. So we don't really know when we run out of money. But at some point, unless we raise the debt ceiling, we run out of money and the government is unable to continue to pay its bills. It really stresses me when I see in so many of the articles I read that they're quoting certain senators, certain representatives that are up for re-election. 
in this cycle and all of a sudden they're talking about, well, you know, maybe something contentious, well, whether this works or not, it's going to benefit me in my election. That absolutely drives me nuts. Maybe I could ask a final quick, well, it's not a quick question, but perhaps you could uh, give us a little thumbnail sketch. Just as a final thought, let's assume we do move past this quote unquote crisis and we do get down to business. And for some reason, a miracle occurs. We really decide we need to do something. We tried to uh, sit down and reason together. What are the things we should reason over? What would be maybe the top three things that you think we could do to cut down on the debt limit, cut down on the budget? Well, I, I note, first of all, even though so-called discretionary spending, not automatic spending, th those things are not the focus that I'm most concerned about. I, I note that during COVID, we spent a lot of new money on a lot of good things, safety net things to help people during a critical time. We need to pull back from the reality that COVID is no longer there and all those checks that we sent out were probably too much. Uh, and we, so we need to we cut back some of those things that we have control over. Then there are the entitlements that we don't vote on. That's the area of government, two thirds of spending, which is growing faster than the economy. There's been almost no political appetite to say, OK, how do we make sure that we protect Social Security long term so that it's there for someone who's 20 or 30 or 40? Let's make the adjustments we need to to protect Social Security and balance what goes out with what comes in. And same thing with Medicare and Medicaid. The House, for instance, has said, look, if you're receiving government support from Medicaid for the poor or, or food stamps, you ought to be working. If you're not working, you shouldn't get these benefits. And uh, now, obviously, both young children or people going to school, that's a different matter. But, but we, we, we want people to be engaged in our economy if they're going to receive benefits from the, from the economy and from the government. So th these are the kinds of things I think we can work on. I've got a piece of legislation which is designed to bring balance to our entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I hope that uh, we're able to take that up in the Senate and in the House. Uh, we've got Democrats that have signed on, leading Democrats, leading Republicans. Uh, I think we can get there, but it's gonna take some leadership on the part of the White House. We need to get the president to the table. Senator, I always appreciate our conversations. Thank you so much for joining us this morning here on Sunday Edition. Thanks, Doug, good to be with you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on Sunday edition today. We hope you'll be back again next week. Music and the spoken word is coming up next.